My name is Deborah Gruby and I'm a chemical engineer by training and degree. My experience has primarily been in uh, chemical and oil and gas working in operations, engineering, management, and safety. One of the reasons why managers, at least that I've seen, that managers and executives don't listen to the technical team that they hire and, 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 and nurture and pay uh, is because the advice of the team uh, comes in a way that sort of comes at cross purposes to what the managers feel is something they have to deliver. It comes into a bit of a problem sometimes because if you have a, a large delay and you're a for-profit corporation, you end up with issues with, with shareholders. And when large projects uh, and a company's depending on a large project to come forward, there is a balance that someone has to make the call around which way are we going to go? Are we gonna go and try to honor the shareholder or are we gonna do what's right for the public? And sometimes those answers are hard, those are hard decisions because no one has a perfect crystal ball that can foresee what the future's going to bring. And People always think, well, maybe we can just ignore this and it'll go away. And my experience has been that if, if people are bringing you technical problems and you're a manager, you really should listen to them because they're giving you some real concerns. And if you don't spend time listening to them, you're going to spend time doing other things and paying other amounts of money after the fact. Uh, I once worked with an executive in a railroad company who asked me, well, how do I get a better safety culture in my company? And I said, you have to think differently. And so are you willing to change your thought patterns? And part of the human element in this is that when an executive achieves you know, CEO status or is chairman of the board, uh, they really think, wow, I'm hot stuff, you know, I've come really far. And they, they lose the fact that they may still have more things to learn. And the, that, that's where the, the notion of the arrogance comes in, is that if, if, you, if you get beyond learning, then, then you're in for problems. And I think that's one of the, the, the essences that I see where an engineer, many of these executives are engineers, so they can't, they have to sort of keep that in mind. Uh, and their, their engineering in mind as they go about making decisions with respect to financial, uh, you know, well-beings of their, of their shareholders. In a uh, refinery, there is a, um, every refinery is, you're very interested in fires because if you have a fire in a refinery that usually indicates you've had a loss of containment somewhere because gasoline is, is very flammable and it will ignite hydrogen auto ignites, uh, natural gas, which is also present in, in refineries in large quantities, it has a tendency to, you know, ignite. And so there's, um, it's very uh, easy to get a sense of how well your containment is because of, you know, by looking at the level of fires. And so in uh, some conversations with some clients, I, you ask the question, well, to the fire chief, well, how many fires do you have in this refinery? And he said, well, I can tell you how often my, ref my trucks leave the barn, the fire trucks leave the barn. I said, that wasn't the question I asked. How many fires do you have? So you can have a fire and have it be put out by a blanket. You can have a fire and have it be put out by a fire extinguisher. You can have a motor overheat and have smoke. I said, what, what's your data on that? And he said, we don't keep that data anymore. I used to keep it, but I would give the report to the refinery manager every month. And he would ask me, why do you give me this information? It's not important. I don't need it. Stop doing that extra work. And so that tells me that the manager doesn't understand what this data is. The manager is not competent to, to be in a refinery. He might be competent from a financial standpoint, but he's not competent from an operational standpoint. And his arrogance about the financial standpoint never leads him to ask the question of the fire chief, uh, why are you giving me this information and what should I do with it? Another instance would be a, a, a process safety engineer who's beavering away, so to speak, in his cubicle, 
uh, taking, keeping track of all of the data that's necessary per, you know, OSHA regulations. But his boss and his boss's boss never ask for that information. And so he's got the data, he knows there's problems, he's raised the issue many times, but they all go, yeah, 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 right. And so they never really listen. And that, that's the level of, that sets the seeds for, you know, future disasters. A good company would have a good solid engineering base and they would have a, organ, a senior management people that ask the engineers for their input and listen to what the engineer said. And then decided, okay, how do we best manage risk? Because in the end, the engineer is involved with helping the organization better manage r risk. And so the, we do have money to spend, where should we be spending it? And that's the executive's decision around where to spend it. The engineers can have and should have input into that conversation, but the executives are the ones that have to make the final call because ultimately they become accountable to the shareholders. My father was a high voltage lineman. And so I learned about safety at the dinner table. So when I studied engineering, it, it became apparent to me that if I was not careful, my job could kill me. That led me to a, a focus on safety so that if I was going to go into work in the chemical industry, I was going to go to work for a company that paid attention to safety because I knew what a lack of safety could do. Because I, as an only child, I worried about what would happen to my family, my mom and me, if my dad was killed on the job, if he was electrocuted on the job. I think the, uh, the challenge for the um, for, for us is, as, as engineers is to make sure that we effectively balance our professional responsibility and, and keep in mind that the public safety always comes above our own careers. And I will tell you that if you get involved in a serious incident or are on the fringes of a serious incident, that it will forever affect your life your thinking, and those of the people close to you, just as well as, as a death would af permanently affect a family. The, uh, a doctor, as a professional, a surgeon, may operate on one person. If something goes wrong, that one person dies. A lawyer, also a licensed professional, if they lose a case, the person may uh, end up being executed in the, in the worst case. Uh, or go to jail for a long period of time. Uh, a, uh, a hairdresser who used chemicals on my head, so, so to speak, uh, would, would also uh, have to be licensed because of their ability to hurt or harm uh, the members of the public who come into their hair salon. Uh, an engineer, at this point in time, does not necessarily have to be licensed in some circumstances of work. And yet an engineer with one mistake can kill more people than any doctor, any lawyer, or any hairdresser. I would like to see organizations, all organizations, that includes governmental organizations, it includes uh, engineering societies, it includes businesses, for-profit businesses and not-for-profit businesses, to have an, an ethos in their uh, working, um, of the working of their, of their entity that pays it to, that they've decided in advance what, they, what do they stand for. And I will tell you that if you are safe, you will make money. I mean that, you know, if, if everything else will out, Normally, you will make money because the level of attention that's required to manage safety well, if you, if you train yourself to do that for safety, you will find you will bring that kind of thought process to all of your work. And that attention to detail is what makes the difference between good and great. One of the uh, examples that, that I have found and, and I use in, in my business is how does an engineer or how does a supervisor or, or a, an operator and a supervisor uh, interact in a uh, difficult situation and how do they make decisions? How are they thinking about their work, number one, and then how do they make decisions that can impact life or death? 
And so I'd like to use the example of Piper Alpha, uh, which is a uh, platform, uh, that uh, oil and gas platform in the North Sea, that on the 6th of July, 1988, there was a series of incidents that occurred that resulted in the death of 168 people. There were a series of miscommunications that led to an oil fire. Let me just say that. So now you have a platform with 200, over 200 people on board and there's an oil fire. And generally oil fires are able to be managed. Uh, and platforms are built to address oil fires. Uh, the Piper platform, though, was part of a field in the North Sea, and Piper served as a collection platform, which meant that other platforms who were extracting oil and gas fed Piper's uh, pipes to Piper, and then Piper pumped it to shore, compressed the gas and pumped it to shore. And so what happened subsequently in the course of two hours, um, very, very sad series of events, whereas the sister platforms, uh, and I believe their names were Tartan and Claymore, the sister platforms continued to pump gas in 36-inch headers, you know, huge pipes, th pipes that are three feet in diameter, uh, huge pipes uh, pumping gas into the Piper platform. The operators wanted to shut down the supervisors said no. And so the, the operators wanted to do the right things. The operators said, we should shut down. And the supervisors said, no, don't shut down. And they actually fed the fire, caused serious damage, and, and, and the heat from the gas fires basically melted the steel and caused all those deaths. And so what happens to the company? Um, that company, Occidental in that case, left the um, North Sea the following year and they're a much smaller company because of that. Uh, and, and what would it have cost to have given those supervisors, what's called the Offshore Installation Manager or OIM, to give the OIM the full permission, now they do have it now, but the full permission to shut down on, at any, for any reason, at any time. It's the OIM's call that you don't have to call, you know, sure to do that. And so anybody can, sort of like um, Toyota in their production system, anybody can hit the button and stop the line. Okay, if you see something wrong, you can stop the line. And so, and that's how it should be with, with respect to safety. And so the engineer's role or the operator's role in this is to make sure that they're well enough trained and that the supervisors are well enough trained and aligned and what is the most important thing we do here? Yes, we do produce oil and gas, but we must do it safely. And the safely piece is the showstopper. As engineers, we sometimes feel distant or remote from um, the end result of what we're working on. The, um, if I'm working on a, on a product development, uh, and I'm running into some problems and some things surface that are probably not right. But because I'm separated from the end user, I might not feel the passion around trying to fix it because, well, I'm under a deadline and, and we're behind and, you know, there's money issues, could be money issues. So there's other pressures that I have. Uh, I would encourage younger engineers to step back and think, what would it be like if my family or I was going to be using the product that I was working on? And how then would I want to behave as a way to begin to think about this? How would I behave if I knew there was a problem and I'm presented with it? I think a great example for me is an airplane. If you know there's a problem on an airplane and you're part of that design process and you know that problem was never fixed, would you, would you get on that airplane? Would your family get on that airplane? Uh, would you allow your family to get on that airplane? Or what would you do about that? How would you raise that question? Because I think an engineer has a, a professional responsibility to put the safety of the public above their own career development. That is, I think, the hard nut for the engineer to understand, is that you cannot wash yourself of that accountability. 
in the end. And because we really do have to continue to earn the public trust by the output of our work. And that means all of our work every day.